We've arrived in our consideration to the seventh and final axiom with respect to the content and form of all sermons worthy to be classified as expressions and manifestations of biblical preaching. And the seventh axiom is this, the proclamation, explanation, and application of scriptural truths for a reasonable and an appropriate length of time must be our constant practice. Now I have to say at the outset that I'm very aware of the fact that there are some unpredictable matters related to the circumstances and the dynamics of actually preaching our sermons which will greatly influence our judgment as to what is a reasonable and an appropriate length of time. For example, conditions of the weather, the state of your own vocal apparatus, the measure of unction and liberty that rests upon you and that is resting upon the people. And those things have to do with the act of preaching and they will influence what is a wise and an appropriate length of time to preach. However, As a general rule, the factors that determine the appropriate length of a sermon are factors bound up in the disciplines of the study and not in the dynamics of the pulpit. Therefore, this matter of the length of a sermon is being considered under the broad category of the content and the form of a sermon and dealing with our labors in the study and at the desk. Now further, by way of introduction, I want to address three conditioning principles which are crucial in any attempt to come to sound views concerning this matter of what constitutes a reasonable and an appropriate length of a sermon. First of all, I would assert that there are no fixed time limits for all preachers under all circumstances. Since the Word of God does not address this issue, giving us precise time limits, but only general principles, we dare not go beyond the Scriptures in our own man-made rules. Furthermore, since the general principles which will help us to determine a reasonable and an appropriate length of time vary in their application from man to man and from circumstance to circumstance, it would be irresponsible to be absolute or rigid rule makers in this matter. For example, Spurgeon comes close to making an ironclad rule for all men at all times when he said to his students, and I quote him, In order to maintain attention, avoid being too long. And I say, Amen. An old preacher used to say to a young man who preached an hour, quote, My dear friend, I do not care what else you preach about, but I wish you would always preach about 40 minutes. We ought seldom to go much beyond that. 40 minutes or say three quarters of an hour. If a fellow cannot say all he has to say in that time, when will he say it? But somebody said he liked to, quote, do justice to his subject, end quote. Well, but he ought not to do, ought he not to do justice to his people, or at least have a little mercy upon them and not keep them too long? The subject will not complain of you, but your people will. So, Spurgeon would tell his students that most men under most circumstances ought to preach 40 to 45 minutes, anything more than that, you really have nothing to say. Well, I'm prepared to say there could well be occasions when it would be insensitive and unwise to preach longer than 30 or 35 minutes. And yet other situations where to preach less than an hour would disobey the clear injunction, quench not the spirit, It would grieve your people and it would do injustice to your subject or to your text. 1 Corinthians 14, 12 must dominate our thinking. 
So also, since you are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that you may abound unto the edifying of the church. Maximum edification of our people must be the driving passion of our hearts when we wrestle with this issue of how long shall I preach? Now, the second conditioning principle that we must keep before us is this. As surely as there are no fixed times for all preachers in all circumstances, there are no fixed time limits to any one preacher at all times and in all of his circumstances. The scripture commands us, quench not the spirit. Paul could say of his own ministry, I kept back nothing that was profitable to you. He could say further there in Acts 20 that he declared the whole counsel of God, but he doesn't reveal to us the specific time frames within which he laid out the whole counsel of God. So I'm urging you, don't get yourself into an internal mental state in which you say forever and ever, I'm a 30-minute preacher, I'm a 40-minute preacher, I'm a 50-minute preacher, I'm a one-hour preacher. Always that, only that, never anything else. No doubt you will find yourself locking into a general pattern, and it's right to do so. But don't allow your ordinary pattern to become either your cruel master driving you beyond what you can say, well, I'm a 40-minute man. At 30 minutes, I've run out of saying anything meaningful. I'll fill up the rest of the 10 minutes with fluff. No, that's allowing your ordinary pattern to be a cruel master driving you beyond what is unto edification to your people or your ordinary pattern can become your prison in which you lock yourself and thereby violate 1 Corinthians 7, 23. You were bought with a price. Be not the slaves of men, even the man who is doing the preaching. How much we need the active pressure of the golden rule upon us as we consider this issue of the length of a sermon, as you would that others do unto you. Even so do ye also unto them, for this is the law and the prophets. But then the third introductory principle is this. If you have agreed to a specific time limit, it is unethical not to keep it, even though you feel that you must go beyond the time to which you've committed. The scripture says the righteous swears to his own hurt and keeps it. And again, the golden rule, if you secured someone to speak in a given setting and in the planning of that meeting, you had 50 minutes or an hour for the preaching and other matters were involved, you would be grieved if they did not respect the commitment that they made. You would violate Matthew 7 and verse 12. Furthermore, the scripture tells us, let your yea be yea, and your nay, nay. In some situations, you're under no obligation to make any time-limiting commitment. However, if you judge that the limits are righteous, just, and good, and that it's a good stewardship of your time, then having made that commitment, stick to it. Even though you're just two-thirds of the way through the sermon, you look at the clock and say, I made a commitment to speak for half an hour. My half an hour is gone, let us pray. And if nothing else, people will respect you for your integrity. If people complain to you about the brevity, then tell them to speak to those who are in charge. Perhaps the next time they will give you more time in which to preach. Now, having addressed these concerns by way of a general introduction to our subject, let us take up together three categories of concern which form the heart of our lecture today. In wrestling with this question, how long shall I preach? We must consider, first of all, what I am calling factors involved in determining the reasonable and appropriate length of time for any given sermon. 
And there are three such factors. Number one, factors present in the preacher himself. And what are they? Well, we descend again to three. Number one, the measure of his gift to hold the attention of those to whom he is preaching. Dr. Lloyd-Jones gives a very perceptive comment on this principle. My final word, and it's not inappropriate at this point, is the length of the sermon. Again, I would say that we must not be mechanical or too rigid either way. What determines the length of the sermon? First and foremost, the preacher. Time is a very relative thing, is it not? Ten minutes from some men seems like an age, while an hour from another passes like a few minutes. That is not simply my personal view. It is what congregations say. As it thus varies with the man, it is therefore ridiculous to lay down a flat rule with regard to the length for all preaching. So as we wrestle with this matter, there is the matter of factors present in the preacher himself. First of all, his gift to hold the attention of those to whom he is preaching. And many things determine at any given point in time this gift to hold the attention of men. And we need constantly to come back to Romans 12 and verse 3. For I say through the grace that was given me to every man that is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but so to think as to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to each man a measure of faith. And I believe that it's at this point that some of the greatest sins are committed in our circles. As one dear brother said to me, he said, brother, he's a dear southern brother, he said, uh, I can count on one hand with a finger or two to spare the men who can hold you for an hour. The trouble is we've got preachers by the handfuls who think they can. And I think that is a real danger in our circles, that men think that because they've sat under ministries of men who can hold you for an hour, that if they are preaching the same stuff from the same perspective, they must have a gift to hold you for an hour when they don't. They are 40-minute men, they are 50-minute men, and when they press on to the hour, they lose you a time and time again in that last 10 or 15 minutes. So these are, this is a factor that every preacher must wrestle with before God and continually to wrestle with it in his ongoing experience. Then secondly, with respect to the preacher, there is the measure of his present growth as a preacher, this flows out of the first. A man may only have the ability to sustain interest and truly edify and please the true people of God for half an hour to 35 minutes in the early days of his ministry. If so, then let him preach for half an hour to 35 minutes. His people will grow to love him, to esteem him, to respect him for his good sense and thereby be more disposed to expect more from him in the days to come. Further, if he is naturally loquacious and realizes the danger of simply running on to please himself, he will cut back and economize in order to edify, making his sermons more compact and richer in thought. Again, we listen to Spurgeon at this point, I agree with him. If you ask me how you may shorten your sermons, I say, study them better. Spend more time in the study that you may need less in the pulpit. We are generally longest when we have the least to say. A man with a great deal of well-prepared matter will probably not exceed 40 minutes, when he has less to say, he'll go on for 50 minutes, and when he has absolutely nothing, he will need an hour to say it in. Attend to these minor things, and they will help retain attention. We do not come before our people as prophets. The prophet had to deliver the burden of the Lord no matter how long it was or how short it was. 
We come as shepherds. We come as pastors, as teaching elders. And it is and ought to be a concern to us, are we pleasing the spiritually minded people in our assembly? And again, I sense an edge in men that says, look, I've got the word of God and I've got the burden of the Lord. Like it or not, I'm going to dump it on my people. But when spiritually minded people who love Christ, love the word of God and love preaching are giving the signals, brother, you're going on too long. You're beating stuff thin at the edges. We need to listen to them and respond accordingly, taking our own present measure as preachers. But then the third qualifying uh, principle relative to the preacher himself is the measure of his physical and mental strength. As I hope to prove in my treatment of the act of preaching in a subsequent module, preaching is an activity of the whole man. It's not just mental, it's not just spiritual, it is physical. His whole redeemed humanity is engaged in the act of preaching. And God has endowed men with varying measures of both physical and mental strength. And even when nature's gifts are cultivated by consistent discipline to maximize their potential, differences will be evident. Some men have a teacup mind full of good matter when they come to preach, and it's housed in a very fragile clay pot. Now that's going to affect how long the man will preach. He's got a teacup mind. Now it's full of good matter, but even the teacup mind is being dispensed through a weak physical frame. That will affect how long he preaches. Some men have a mug-sized mind full of rich matter and it's housed in an unusually strong and vigorous physical constitution. God will expect more from that man in the expenditure of his whole humanity in the preaching of the word. 1 Peter 4.11 is a very helpful text to give us some direction in this area of concern. If any man speaks, speaking as it were oracles of God, if any man ministers, ministering as of the strength which God supplies. As of the strength which God supplies. So then, my brothers, the first category of factors that ought to be soberly, accurately, and constantly considered as they relate to the sermon's length are factors present in the preacher. Now, secondly, there are factors present in the hearers. And we must determine that we will not be indifferent to these factors in our people. In my judgment, there are four questions that need to be programmed into our minds and hearts and drawn out, if not every time we prepare to preach, certainly periodically as we wrestle with the question, how long shall I preach? Factors in the people. Here are the four questions. Number one, whom are we addressing? Are we addressing a congregation comprised of people with well-trained minds? Are we addressing a congregation of farmers up since 4.30 amen, uh, a.m., amen, uh, a.m. for their first milking? In pastoral settings, seek to be sensitive to the general complexion of your ordinary Lord's Day hearers. This will influence your decision as to the length of your sermon. You may have a number of nursing mothers. You may have a number of little ones who are being trained to sit in the service. Hear again the wise and earthy advice of Mr. Spurgeon on this matter. Whom are we addressing? In some country places, Spurgeon writes, in the afternoon especially, the farmers have to milk their cows. And one farmer bitterly complained to me about a young man I think, Spurgeon said, from this college. Sir, 
He ought to have given over at four o'clock, but he kept on till half past, and there were all my cows waiting to be milked. How would he have liked it if he'd been a cow? There was a great deal of sense in that question. The Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals ought to have prosecuted that young sinner. How can farmers hear to profit when they have cows on the brain? The mother feels morally certain during that extra 10 minutes of your sermon that the baby is crying or the fire is out and she cannot and will not give her heart to your ministry. You are keeping her 10 minutes longer than she bargained for and she looks upon it as a piece of injustice on your part. There is a kind of moral compact between you and your congregation that you will not weary them more than an hour and a half. He's speaking of the whole service. And if you keep them longer, it amounts to an infraction of a treaty and a piece of practical dishonesty of which you ought not to be guilty. Brevity is a virtue within the reach of all of us. And do not let us lose the opportunity of gaining the credit which it brings. Whom are we addressing? will greatly influence the question, how long shall I preach? Second question regarding the people that we're ministering to, what is the general spiritual climate of those to whom I'm preaching? What we say, including how long we take to say it, should take this into consideration. Remember the text I quoted in a previous Act dealing with a previous axiom. Jesus said, I have many things to say unto you. You're not yet able to bear them. The writer to Hebrews concerning Melchizedek, I have many things I want to say. You're not yet able to bear them. When Paul was dearly loved and among dearly loved friends and he was about to leave them, Acts 20 and verse 7 says, he went on speaking through the night. Now granted, He had to go raise a man from the dead who fell out of a window sound asleep. But that was an unusual circumstance. Here was Paul in that intimate circle of fellowship with the believers there at Troas. Some have a shrunken spiritual stomach and it needs to be stretched gradually. And you need to preach them into the state of a greater hunger and capacity for the word but don't treat them as though they have that enlarged spiritual capacity. The injunction of our Lord applies here, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Far better to have one after another of the people coming and saying, Pastor, why do you keep preaching for only 30, 35 minutes? You just get our hearts awakened and and we begin to taste the sweetness of the word and then you're done. Well, then a man can begin to preach 40 minutes and then after 40 minutes, it may be the appetite continues to increase and far better to have the time of your sermons lengthened in response to the delightful experience of listening to you as it is reflected in your people. Then the third question, what is your relationship to the people at this particular point in time? Are you a relative stranger, a visiting preacher? Are you an unknown commodity? Are you a beloved friend? Are you a confidant to many? This will contribute to the issue of appropriate time. Again, Spurgeon is right on the money when he says when the preacher first settles, He cannot expect that his congregation will give him that solemn, earnest attention which those obtain who stand up like fathers among their own children, endeared to their people by a thousand memories and esteemed for age and experience. Our whole life must be such as to add weight to our words so that in after years we shall be able to wield the invincible eloquence of a long-sustained character and obtain not merely the attention, but the affectionate veneration of our flocks. If by our prayers and tears and labors our people become spiritually healthy, we need not fear that we shall lose their attention. And that's true, brethren, and I can bear witness to that. 
I can get away with things at this stage that it would have been foolish for me to attempt 20 years ago, even 10 years ago, much less 40 years ago. What is the present relationship that you sustain to your people? And then the fourth question, what are the physical and natural circumstances in which you are addressing the people? We don't preach to disembodied spirits. And if our Lord was conscious, they are following me now these days. If I send them home, they will faint upon the way. The Lord was sensitive to the physical circumstances of his listeners. And when the weather is heavy, or when it's the first Lord's Day after we go on daylight savings time, expect your people, some of them, didn't have sense enough to adjust their clocks at supper time Saturday night and they've lost an hour's sleep and they're going to be sitting there like this. Understand that. Recognize that. Don't browbeat them. Show some good sense and say, folks, I know a number of you didn't have a lick of sense in turning your clocks ahead when you should have, but you've repented, you've asked the Lord to forgive you, and now I'm going to mirror God's heart towards you. I'm only going to preach 40 minutes this morning. But I'm not really hang in there with you, you see. Be sensitive. Years ago, when we met in what we now affectionately call the cracker box, that little building had no insulation, very little movement of air. We actually had a preacher one time faint preaching in the cracker box. We had to come up and carry him in the back room. I mean, he went dead out. Boom, he went out. And there are times we were oxygen starved when we first moved into phase one here. Similar thing. It was terrible. And if we who preached did not recognize that, we'd have been cruel to our people. So there are factors in the preacher, factors in the hearers. Now then, there are factors present in the content of the sermon. In the light of such previously established axioms, such as unity of discourse, thrust and point of application, and issues yet to be addressed in the specific guidelines for sermon preparation, we dare not be rigid and fix all of our sermons into the 30, 40, 50, 60 minute mold. Some sermons, in terms of their content, demand 35 or 40 minutes of solid, clear, convincing, illustrated exposition. And then the most concentrated, searching, helpful application that will take at least 15 minutes. And there would be no way to preach such a sermon in less than 50 to 55 minutes. On the other hand, other sermons in the same book you are expounding, the same theme you are opening up in a topical expository manner, may have so few difficulties in the exposition that only 15 or 20 minutes are needed to convince the judgment of your people that you have opened up the meaning of the text. And you can only come up with 20 minutes of good, distilled, pointed application. What are you to do? Preach a good 40-minute sermon and sit down, pray and dismiss the people, or beat the last 10 minutes thin at the edges. I had that experience just a couple of weeks ago in this series on adoption that I just completed. And I quit about 20 minutes earlier than I normally do. And people said, Pastor, why did you quit? Because I said, I said all that I was prepared to say and all that I felt needed to be said under that particular heading. I was dealing with the blessings of adoption and I had dealt with one of those blessings, originally had thought of dealing with two or three in one sermon. But in my detailed preparation, it became clear to me that if I dealt with just that one, it would be enough for our people. And so I quit. Now, that was good for the people to see that at least the man still got some good sense even though he's getting old. And so I urge you, brethren, to be sensitive to factors present in the content of the sermon itself. Now, I'm not sure I would go this far as Broadus goes, but he's got some good counsel. As to the length of a sermon, it would be well for a pastor to get it understood that he may sometimes make the sermon very short and sometimes quite long. 
There are subjects that can be made very interesting and instructive for 20 minutes, but to occupy 30 or 40 minutes, it would be necessary to introduce matter really foreign and such as will lessen the effect or so hammer out the style as to make it less impressive. Many a preacher has thought of subjects or texts of precisely this description and has been compelled either to abandon them or to spoil them in one of the ways indicated. Why not occasionally preach a very short sermon of 20 or even 15 minutes? In that case, if circumstances warrant, the other services, that is, the remainder of the worship service, without remark, may be made longer than usual, pains being taken to render them interesting and impressive. On the other hand, there are subjects which imperatively demand an extended treatment and cannot well be divided. And the preacher, especially when at home, that is, in his own pulpit, ought to feel at liberty to occupy a full hour, or in rare cases, even more, provided he is sure the sermon will have such a variety of distinct points, such stirring movement from beginning to end, and such sustained energy of delivery as will keep the people interested in a high degree. You see how he recognized with all the old masters, we've got to be sensitive to the people to whom we are preaching and to the nature of that given sermon. Within these limits, the proper average in towns will probably be from 30 to 45 minutes, the former being best where the habitual mode of treating a subject is condensed and concentrated, the latter where it is more discursive and varied. It's obvious that much depends on the mode of treatment. So factors that are relative to the content of the sermon, but if ahead of time, you have so programmed yourself, I'm a 40-minute man, I'm a 50-minute man. I hope there aren't too many that judge that you can week after week, month after month, sustain people for a full hour. There may be some who can, to his own master or servant, stands or falls. But if you get yourself locked into the mentality, then you're not Christ's free man as you sit at the desk and prayerfully wrestle with what you're to bring to God's people. Be Christ's free man at all times. But then fourthly, there are factors not only in the preacher, in the hearers, in the sermon, but factors relative to what I'm calling the presence of God. Unless Christ has judiciously removed the candlestick, he is present in all the true gatherings of his people. Where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst. However, as you well know, the corporate awareness and the felt measure of his presence varies in degree from Lord's Day to Lord's Day. When Christ is present in an unusual degree, and we know it by that anointing that comes upon the preacher and the anointing that comes upon the people, time becomes relatively unfelt and unimportant. And you've known that. You've experienced that. In the age to come, our consciousness of time will be different from what it is now. I don't know how. But when it says there's no night, but they serve him day and night in his presence, something's going to be different. And when we read this little phrase in Hebrews, they have tasted the powers of the age to come, I wonder. Is that just a little taste when in those settings you are preaching and you know you're preaching well over your head? There are times you want to stand to the side and say, who said that? Your mind in friction with the truth comes alive and you're conscious that the Spirit of God is bringing into that most delicate coordination thought and feeling, and ability to express words that you haven't used for ages are coming into play, and you're conscious the people are hanging upon the word, time becomes irrelevant. Time becomes irrelevant. And in those settings, then the texts that ought to be before us 
is 1 Thessalonians 5, 19. Do not quench the Spirit. God is present. He is speaking through you and to His people. And we need to be sensitive to that. Now, if we think those factors are present, time after time after time, and preach accordingly, and our people come to us and indicate that they are not aware of it, then we need to ask ourselves whether we are self-deceived in our perception of what is going on. So, those are the factors, those four categories that need to be considered as we wrestle with the question, how long shall I preach? Having covered the three conditioning principles, the four major categories of factors, now I wish to give a few practical exhortations and then discuss several practical problems in connection with our subject. The practical exhortations are four. Number one, if you err, and that's the proper way of pronouncing the word err, when you err, you make an error, but you don't err, you err. If you err, err on the side of being too brief. If you err, err on the side of being too brief. Think of the analogy of a good meal. If the dessert, you weren't quite so sure you should eat it, if it caused you to feel stuffed and turned you into a kind of burping machine, it can ruin all that went before. All you remember is that you stuffed down that dessert. It may have been a beautifully prepared and beautifully presented meal, but that stuffed down dessert ruined it all. Well, that's what happens to God's people. You go five or ten minutes longer than the people are with you and all they remember is you went too long. That dominates the mind. That's the way we're put together. You know it from your own experience. So if you err, my counsel is err on the side of being too brief. You're in this for the long haul and far better to have a growing groundswell of your people coming saying, Pastor, why did you stop? Why didn't you go on? Then to have people who wouldn't come to us and tell us, but feel in their hearts, there we go again. There we go again. If you err, err on the side of being too brief. Secondly, don't be overly sensitive to a malcontent minority of unspiritual people who may complain about the length of your sermon. Don't be overly concerned with them. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew eleven sixteen: This generation is like kids in the marketplace. They come out one day and say, let's play wedding. Have a happy time. Nah, I don't feel happy. Okay, let's play funeral. No, I don't feel sad. Such people, if you preach short sermons, then they begin to whisper and say, what are we paying him for? He only preaches a half-hour sermon. You labor to preach an edifying 40-minute sermon. What in the world are we doing? This guy keeps you forever and ever. Don't pay too much attention to a malcontent, unspiritual people who may complain about the length of your sermons. But now hear me. Here's a balancing word of counsel. Don't be overly influenced by the excessive enthusiasm of the hungry but insensitive minority, often single people with no children, who constantly come and say, Pastor, I wish you'd gone another half an hour. I had that happen just a couple of weeks ago, so I gave a single man a little lesson in pastoral theology. I said, my brother... There are women sitting here. It was time for them to go down and get their babies in the nursery and nurse them. They were hurting. Kid was crying. Time to go home. <laughs> you let them know. And some people, it's like heady wine. I mean, one or two people say, oh, pastor, you could have gone on for another hour. And I, oh, they, woo, woo. I'm Whitfield back from the dead. No, no, you're not Whitfield back from the dead. You've got a, an excessively enthusiastic, undiscerning, probably a single person. And then, brethren, what about your own health? We have a responsibility to love our neighbor as ourselves, assuming there is a proper self-love that needs to come into consideration with regard to this matter of the length of our sermons 
And then my fourth word of practical exhortation is master the time-saving devices. And what are those time-saving devices? Let me give you five of them quickly. Limit parallel citations. If quoting one text will demonstrate that the meaning you've assigned to a word will do it, don't quote five. Limit parallel citations. Quote parallel citations without turning to them. That's the area that over the years I still haven't mastered it, is being able to discern in my notes I may see uh, under a given heading, C and let, let a text, C, let a text, and a list of text. And then I don't realize that that little exercise is going to take me five to seven minutes. When everyone turns to it, I read it, say a word about the context. So learn judiciously to quote without turning to parallel citations. Be prepared to omit second-rate material. We want our best material, our front rank soldiers, to do our work. Counsel number four, stick closely to your notes in the didactic portion or explication segment of your sermon. One of the disciplines I have found over the years that has been helpful here is that sometimes in opening up the passage, your mind and your heart are expanding with it and you're tempted to take off before you should. Stick closely to what you have worked out in the study to expound, to open up, to explain the text. And then, number five, have prepared summations available at each major transition. That comes, of course, more into the actual construction of sermons that I hope to address in another uh, module. But in this place, just giving that as counsel, as time savers in trimming off the fat in our sermons. And then I conclude with addressing some practical problems. Here's the problem. What should I do if in my intermediate or advanced preparation, things expand beyond what I know will con constitute a reasonable limit? Most of us know over the years that three pages of notes or four pages of notes equals 50 minutes of preaching. However we do it, each of us, I know for me, four pages of closely handwritten notes which have gotten more fulsome over the years than less because I have found the only way I can rein in my spirit and rein in what is a growing corpus of understanding and experience is to stick more rigidly to four pages of closely handwritten notes that keeps me within my time limits of preaching. What should I do, though, if in my intermediate preparation it's evident this can't be squeezed into the four pages? What do I do? I know if I go beyond that, I'm going to go beyond a reasonable time frame in trying to preach it. Well, here is my counsel. Reform your goals for that particular sermon. Or exercise the discipline of exclusion or divide the material into two or more sermons, or occasionally, occasionally, but don't do this every other week, come before your people and say, dear people, in my preparation, it became evident to me that to open up this passage would take me beyond the normal time limits, but as I sought to divide it, I could not find a way to divide it without robbing you of some vital spiritual understanding and perspectives Bear with me, as I will be preaching a bit longer this morning than I ordinarily do. You're showing them that you're sensitive to their expectations. They've come and they expect that at a given time frame, they're going to be dismissed, gather their children from the nursery, make their way home for their lunch, etc. Beg their indulgence, preach a longer sermon, but, as I say, don't do that every other week. After a while, the people will not appreciate it. And then secondly, what should I do if in the act of preaching, things expand beyond what I expected? Well, and here again, I can only say what I've learned to do, and that is when it's expanded and you knew that you could not 
squelch what was expanding in your own mind and heart in the act of preaching and you were not going to quench the Spirit, put out the fire of the Spirit. It may be untidy homiletically, but powerful from a spiritual and even rhetorical standpoint. Say to your people, dear people, this thing has flowered in my own heart. I'm only two-thirds of the way through my sermon, but my time is done. Let us pray. Then you can always tidy up how you're going to come back and fit it. But in the moment, if the thing strikes fire, go with the fire, but then have sense enough to quit when you ought to quit. And again, the people will love you and respect you for your good sense in the matter. Now, let's see. I do have time. I want to give you some advice from the old writers on this matter. First of all, Here are the words, I believe, of Ebenezer Porter, no, William Taylor, or Hoppin, my friend Hoppin. You don't know Hoppin. Hoppin's been long buried in a couple of books that have never been reprinted. As to the length of sermons, we would add a word. The history of this subject is somewhat suggestive as well as amusing. The sermons of the first five centuries varied in length according to preacher, place, and circumstances. Very thing I've been emphasizing. Then he gives a little uh, praises of that. And then he says, long sermons were the product of the post-Reformation, especially of Puritan times. Yet some of the earlier divines were lengthy. Bishop Alcock preached at St. Mary's Cambridge a good and pleasant sermon which lasted from one o'clock to half past three. Sometimes the audiences in olden times in England scraped their feet and thus compelled the preacher to desist. The time was measured by the hourglass standing on the pulpit, and when the hour was finished, the preacher turning it over would invite his hearers to another glass. <laughs> And then he goes on to say on the next page, there is in fact no rigid rule to be laid down. Subjects make their own time in treating them. Some subjects imperatively demand lengthy treatment, but whatever our theory of preaching may be, whether we view preaching as a constituent part of worship or simply as a didactic exercise, which I trust we don't, religious feeling and good sense point generally to a forcible brevity in preaching, though some topics will not suffer themselves to be handled in a short time. Muloy and his pastor and people says sensibly, believe me, and I speak from experience, the more you say, the less the hearers will retain. The less you say, the more they will profit. By dint of burdening their memory, you will overwhelm it just as a lamp is extinguished by feeding it with too much oil and plants are choked by immoderate irrigation. When a sermon is too long, this is profound insight, when a sermon is too long, the end erases the middle from the memory and the middle the beginning. Even mediocre preachers are acceptable provided their discourses are short, whereas even the best preachers are a burden when they speak too long. And then I commend to you a careful reading of the quotes you have from a book that I did not come upon till relatively recently, The Heart of the Yale Lectures by Bastel Barrett Baxter, The Three B's. And in that section of the length of sermons, he has quotes from the masters in Israel who have written and spoken on the issue and the counsel given in those four pages is very, very helpful. And I commend it to you for your careful reading as you wrestle with this issue of the length of a sermon. So I come around full circle to our axiom that... The declaration, the proclamation, explanation, and application of scriptural truths for a reasonable and an appropriate length of time must be our constant practice. And in all of these things, brethren, 
We're not perfect men. We're not perfect preachers. But we need to constantly wrestle with the issues that by the grace of God, our ministries will be owned of God and acceptable to the spiritually minded people of God. Let's pray together. Our Father, again, we are conscious that there are so many areas in which we need the help of your Holy Spirit in order to be the kinds of preachers that bring optimum edification to your people. This is our passion, Lord. We are not out to please ourselves, to indulge ourselves, but we want to be instruments in your hands to build up your people in their most holy faith, to help them on their way to heaven, and to be used of you to call sinners out of darkness and into your marvelous light. Thank you again for our time together. We pray your continued blessing to rest upon us. In Jesus' name, amen.